why don't we go ahead and get started. So welcome back everybody to uh, EE240. So I think we basically finished up with sort of the uh, material we were on last time. So we're going to move on to the next lecture. Just really sort of briefly. Oh, that's funny. Okay, where'd my announcements go? Well, okay. Ah, there we go. Well, that's, okay, that's interesting. So the text obviously showed up on the wrong slide there, but that's okay. So basically, midterm is next Thursday. Homework is due this Thursday. I'm sure you guys all know that very well. Uh, so then the only other thing I wanted to just sort of briefly do in terms of scheduling was, you know, in terms of the review session, as those of you guys who have taken classes from before know, essentially what I do is I just show up in a room somewhere. I have zero material prepared, but I promise to answer any questions that you guys have with the obvious exception of just, you know, what is on the exam and what are the answers. So if you happen to ask me what's there, then I'll, I'll answer your question, meaning if you ask me a question that's specific, I'll answer the specific question, but I won't, uh, you know, tell, me, tell you what exactly is on the exam or anything like that. So from that standpoint, since we have a small subset, I guess you guys get to be the deciding factor here. So 2 p.m. on Tuesday, meaning a week from today, does that work for everybody here or, or no? Raise your hand if it doesn't work for you. <laughs> okay, so I think we'll go with this. Uh, I'll post this up on the web. If anybody has any, you know, really strong objections, let me know. But I think we'll basically go with 2 p.m. next Tuesday for the review session. Uh, I'll probably just do it over in 550 Cori, uh, sort of where Pierre Luigi does stuff. Uh, he'll still hold his normal review session as well, but that's where I'll do mine for next week. Uh, by the way, in terms of material, essentially I expect that it will be including everything up until the end of lecture today. Uh, we'll see sort of how far we get, but certainly lecture 10 is fair game in terms of the material for the midterm and obviously everything before that as well. Yeah? It won't cover feedback. Won't cover feedback. Well, it, it won't cover feedback in the sense of, you know, what I would have maybe talked about in my feedback lecture, but certainly, you know, stuff that you should have known from 140 is kind of fair game. So stuff, for example, that's on homework number three is definitely fair game. Any other kind of questions on either material or midterm or logistics, anything like that? How many of you guys are actually done with homework number three? One is halfway brave soul. Two, okay. How many are at least done like two of the problems or something like that? Okay, are people stuck on gain boosting or what's the, what's the problem? Or just haven't gotten there yet? Just haven't gotten there yet. Okay, well, so again, keep in mind that's due this Thursday. I'll have my office hours today and on Thursday. Uh, Pierre Luigi will do his review uh, tomorrow, I believe. But definitely get going on that because you'll want to know all that stuff uh, again for the midterm. Okay, so unless there's other questions, I know this has announcements, but this will be my lecture. Oh, yeah. Sorry, because we just walked in. Uh, up to what lecture is the midterm? 10. Come? So basically, the end of lecture today is going right. to be included on the midterm. And for those of you guys who just walked in, since uh, the people who showed up here early, since they uh, got to vote, we're going to be doing the midterm review session next Tuesday at 2 p.m., most likely in 550 Cori. Again, if you have strong objections, you can come bug me, but, you know, I'll derate your thing by a factor of, I don't know, two or whatever since you were late. Okay, any last questions? Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today is sort of, we'll start talking about simple OTA implementations and sort of what are the things we want to look at and check into. But really we'll spend most of our time kind of talking about why you might actually want to do differential OTAs and in particular fully differential OTAs. Uh, so again, I know this says announcements on your slide. Just pretend it says simplest single-ended OTA. That's what the uh, intent here was. Okay, so to start out with, again, since we just want to start looking at how do we build some OTA and sort of what are the things we want to check. As you can imagine, the simplest thing we might start out with is just essentially a common source amplifier. Okay, so of course that, the device itself will just look something like this, right? Now, I want to be slightly more realistic this time around. So instead of just drawing some ideal current source load, this time I actually want to draw a real current source. Okay, and so this time I'll just use a PMOS transistor for my current source, obviously in saturation. And of course, I also want to bias this thing up so I'll use some sort of current mirror, and just to make life a little bit easier, I'll assume I have some magic bias current, at least for that bias leg over there, okay? So already you could kind of say, okay, fine, I have some relatively simple OTA now, right? Just common source, simple OTA. Well, there's one sort of minor, I shouldn't say issue, but one minor annoyance, let's say, 
which is that if I really want to set the GM of that transistor, I need some sort of DC bias on that VIN, right? And I don't really necessarily want to sort of tweak that every single time in SPICE. So for here, just you know, to sort of, as a simple, let's say, SPICE trick, obviously if you build a real circuit, you have to do it a slightly different way, and we'll see how we do that a little bit later. This is just a simple SPICE trick. What I want to do here is reuse my bias current to essentially actually come up with what's the right bias voltage for that transistor there. Okay, and so the way I'm going to set things up, again, just as this is sort of a spice trick now, essentially I'm just going to tie that current mirror in the second bias leg that I drew over here. That's just going to set the DC voltage going into the transistor, and actually just to be really clear. And then I'm going to tie my input source kind of in between those two terminals like this. Okay, now again, clearly this is not a real circuit. This is just you know, my spice trick that I'm going to use to kind of make some of the plots a little bit more clear. Because if I do it this way, then now if Vn is at zero, you know that's the nominal bias point. If it goes above, it's really above. If it's below, it's really below. You don't have to worry about what that offset of the, v the nominal VGS is supposed to be. Okay. So now I've got my sort of very simple, uh, essentially single-ended OTA. right? So now, the next thing I want to do is just walk through, essentially, if I was designing this circuit, what's kind of the series of simulations I'd do to basically characterize the performance of this thing, OK? So as we're going to see, the very first thing you should essentially always do is a DC simulation, so a dot DC, or even a dot op, in fact. OK, and in fact, I'm going to claim that the very first thing you should always do, once you've built some circuit like this up, is just go and actually measure the bias current in each one of these legs. Okay, so let's say you said that this was 10 microamps. Well, it better be the case that this is 10 microamps. And then I'd say go and actually measure what those bias currents over there really are. Okay? Now, by the way, why do I say that the first thing you want to do is actually do that measurement? You know, why bother even doing that? What's, uh, why do I say that? Yeah, it's a sanity check, right? By the way, what are you sanity checking? Exactly. Right? Basically, A, you want to just sanity check that you didn't do something really stupid. Right? That you didn't, you know, maybe you intended for this transistor to be one micron wide, and you accidentally made it one meter wide. Right? Obviously, if you do that, things will not work so well. Right? So A, you just want to do that bias current, because it's a sanity check. OK? By the way, it's not only a sanity check on yourself, it's also a sanity check on SPICE. Because occasionally you'll do this dot DC, and from whatever bizarre reason, SPICE will decide that it converged to some totally bizarre operating condition. Right? Maybe it'll say, oh, this is actually, I don't know, 100 volts, and you know, this is 10,000 volts, or whatever. Right? Sometimes it just converges to some bogus location for, because maybe you didn't set the circuit up exactly right, or there's some other weird condition you didn't think of. Right? But essentially, you just first want to do a sanity check. Now, by the way, even inside of your schematic, let's say you got all this right, you still actually probably want to annotate on your schematic what really is the bias current in each of these legs. Because okay? it's just kind of a visual reminder for yourself as to what did you expect to really be happening here. In fact, you may even want to annotate what was the GMs you expected from each one of those devices. Now, by the way, keep in mind, even if you sort of got everything right, the exact bias current flowing in each one of those legs is not going to be, you know, even if I set this with a perfect 10 microamps over here, these guys are not necessarily going to have exactly that, even if it's a one-to-one -one current mirror ratio. All right? Just because the VDSs are not exactly the same. So if they're not exactly the same, the current's going to vary a little bit. And so you may not get exactly the GM you intended to get or exactly the bias current you intended to get, OK? But so again, number one thing is just you know, make sure you sanity check stuff, because if you don't, you can run all this long suite of characterization. And if before that, the circuit was obviously set up in a totally bogus way, you're just going to get all kinds of weird results and have no idea where they came from. OK, so let's say you've done that. Well, next thing you do, again, essentially with just a DC simulation, is just look at the input-output transfer characteristic. I'm assuming this should be sort of very familiar to you guys, but we'll just walk through it in a little bit 
more uh, detail here to see sort of how it's useful to us. So here I've obviously done this with real transistors. So unlike, you know, sort of my ideal model, at least the thing we always carry in our head, if you make the input voltage too large in magnitude, then essentially you clip out at one of the two rails, right? It makes perfect sense. You can't get the voltages magically outside of the supply. So, as I'm sure you've again seen many, many times, what this curve basically tells you is kind of what's the range of useful input voltage over which you want to actually use this thing. In other words, if you go outside of that input voltage where you just rail out the amplifier, right? And in fact, the other thing that you're generally going to want to draw here, I'll just do it in a different color, is, and I'm just going to do it sort of sideways from what you're used to, so the other thing you can get from this plot is just what's the small signal gain, which I'm labeling here as AV0, the lowercase a. Just what's the small signal gain as a function of the output swing, right? which maybe would look something like that. Okay. And again, that small signal gain, that's really just the derivative of that transfer curve. Okay, so again, sort of as we've talked about many times, that that gain there, or that gain curve, really just tells you, okay, if I want to get a certain gain spec, let's say, you know, let's say that's 30. I don't know, I've just made it up. But if I want to get a certain gain spec, it just tells you over what range of output voltage can you actually ensure that you have at least that much gain, right? And in fact, perhaps even before that, you may, you may even just check, okay, did I get the gain that I wanted at any point at all? Right? And once you've, of course, done that, then you check, do I actually meet the range that I was interested in? Okay, so this is still just purely with a dot DC simulation. This is just going through and checking that all the things we intended to design are indeed working the way we wanted to. Now, by the way, I should note here, and we'll come back to this a little bit later, notice the gain really does drop off on both sides of the curve. Whereas in comparison, if you looked at, let's say, one of the amplifiers you had designed in homework number two or number three, you may have noticed the gain actually on one side of the curve never dropped. And that was just because we gave you an ideal current source. Right here, if you have real transistors, you get close to the rail, it basically, gain's going to flatten out. Okay? So it makes, makes sense. Everything's now physical and kind of reasonable again. Okay. So... A lot of you guys, I'm sure, are used to sort of looking at the small signal gain plot here. But actually, it turns out that oftentimes, you're going to want to look at something slightly different than that. Okay, so let me first just sort of redraw that plot that we just looked at. And then what I'll do is we'll actually take a look at what oftentimes may really be more important. Okay, so let's just call this, again, AV0 is the small signal gain. Let's call that V out. And you know this will be zero over here, and so you know if we redrew that curve, we might have gotten something that let's say looked like this. Okay. Well, that small signal gain—that's really sort of what you're used to, at least to, uh, what I'm sure you've seen many, many times before. Which again is really just defined as the derivative of this transfer curve here at any given v out. Okay. So that's our standard small signal gain that we're used to. However, I would actually claim that in many situations, in particular in situations where we're using an OTA and feedback, this is not necessarily actually the quantity you care most about. What you might actually care most about is this so-called large signal gain, okay, where this large signal gain is kind of like the total deflection. Okay, and I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that more in one second. But to see why that might actually be the more important thing, Let's just draw a simple feedback OTA. Okay, so let's say something like this. Okay. So let's say I had an OTA like that. So usually, why is it that you care about gain kind of in this context? What is gain sort of important in terms of setting when I look at this amplifier here? And I mean the gain of the OTA by itself, by the way. Why do we want high DC gain? Accuracy. Yeah, we want to make sure that V out over here really is as close to CS over CF times V in 
as possible. Right? So we want it to be very, very accurate. Because the more DC gain we give it, the more the closer V out is going to get to really being that ideal thing that we wanted it to be. Right? Okay, so now let's say that we wanted to characterize how good is our amplifier at doing that with relatively large inputs. So let's say that, I don't know, I put into this thing something like 200 millivolts. Okay? So now what I'm really interested in seeing is, and let's say CS over CF just happens to be 1, just to make my life easier. I don't know, let's make, maybe make it 2. Right? So now what I'm really interested in is, how close to 400 millivolts does that V out really get? Okay? So in order to answer that question, let's sort of think about two potential approaches. So one is, what you could potentially do is say, okay, well, if I have 200 millivolts at the input, let's say I can figure out roughly what this Vx over here is going to be. So then what I could do is I could look at whatever that Vx is, and then look at the small signal gain of that amplifier, given that Vx, right, at the input. So is that really what's going to tell you how close this gets to 400 millivolts, or no? Who thinks that is what tells you the answer? Not the answer? OK, only three or four brave souls. So why is it not the answer? And that is indeed correct. It's not the right answer. So what's the problem here? You're out of the small signal regime. Right. OK, um, sort of. But what's really going to set sort of how close that we get over here, right? Sort of steady state error? OK, it's a steady state error. I agree with that. but. Remember, what is it that this quantity here really tells you? Just sort of by definition, what is that? So what is that lowercase av0? The instantaneous derivative. Yeah, it's the instantaneous derivative, right? It's like the instantaneous gain. So it tells you if I moved by one femtovolt around that whatever that bias point was, it tells you how many additional femtovolts would pop up at the output. Right? But that's not what we're interested in here. What we're interested in is I already moved over by, let's say, I don't know, let's say that Vx ends up being, I don't know, 10 millivolts or something like that. So I want to know if I already moved by 10 millivolts, what was the total voltage swing I already put onto the output? Right? <coughs> Notice that's very different than this instantaneous small signal gain. Because that instantaneous gain, that just tells you, OK, if you go any further beyond that, how much extra swing do you get? But it doesn't tell you how much did you already push to get towards the final answer, right? In fact, that's exactly why if you define this so-called large signal gain, it looks like this. And all this is really saying here is it's the output voltage you get for a given input voltage relative to a nominal bias point of course, for both of them. Okay, So it's kind of telling you, like, what's the total swing you got at the output relative to the total swing you put at the input? Okay? Does this make sense to everybody? Or? By the way, has anybody ever seen this before? Okay, that's what I thought. Okay, so if I'm going to define things this way, now obviously since I spent all this time talking about it, I'm also going to try and figure out what does that curve actually look like. Okay, So on this same plot over here, I also want to plot the large signal gain, which again is just the total swing at the output divided by the total swing at the input. Okay, and Again, I'm actually going to claim this quantity here. That's really what's going to tell you how close to that ideal value do you actually get. Okay. So now let's sort of think about a couple of different options. So if I was to plot that large signal quantity there, I kind of have one of three potential options here. So one is, or actually let's maybe start with a simple thing first. So when you're putting in pretty small input voltages, this curve here looks pretty linear, right? If I look at that gain curve, 
basically looks like a straight line over some region here, right? So if it's a straight line, this large signal gain and that small signal gain, they should be exactly the same. Because right? if I have a small, a straight line, the derivative is exactly, you know, or let's say the derivative, let's say that's k, and the equation of the line is just kx minus b or whatever, right? So those two are exactly the same, okay? So at least for these small ranges over here, they should be right on top of each other. So now the interesting question is, what's going to happen in terms of the large signal gain once I get out to larger deflections? Is it going to be that, let's say, option number one, the large signal gain rolls off earlier. Option number two, it does exactly the same thing. Or option number three, it's actually wider. Okay? So let's see what you guys think. Who thinks the large signal gain does option number one, meaning it's narrower? Option number two? It's exactly the same. Alright, we'll see how many votes we get. Option number three, it's actually wider. Okay, good. It is indeed wider. Why is it wider? What's going on? You guys got the right answer, so you must know why. Other than maybe my tone, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's kind of like the integral of that curve, right? Because I'm asking, what was the total distance that I moved when I got to that point finally? Right? So it's kind of like integrating the small signal gain almost. Right? It's not exactly an integral, but that's exactly the right analogy. Right? Because I'm really asking, what's the total distance that I pushed it? And so indeed, if we, and I'll just draw it on the other side so that it's more clear. Indeed, if you look at the large signal gain, it's always wider than the small signal gain. Okay, because even as the small signal gain starts rolling off right at that point, you've already moved so far that the fact that you start incrementally moving less doesn't have as large of an impact on the large signal gain. Okay? So large signal gain is always wider. So again, <clears throat> we're keeping our DC bias point fixed, right? For the for both of them, yeah. This is this is both at the same <clears throat> DC V out, right? But all I'm looking at is the instantaneous <clears throat> derivative versus the total swing I already got up to that point. Is that clear? Okay. So now, just one last sort of interesting phenomenon you're going to run into because. You know, you are indeed going to be sort of characterizing things this, this way. What happens if I actually measure this large signal gain right at v out equals 0 and v in equals 0? And of course, I mean these relative to the bias point. Yeah. It's going to blow up. Yeah, you're going to get some bizarre answer, right? In SPICE, it's either going to do something like that, or perhaps it may do something like this, right? Because basically it's just 0 over 0. And obviously SPICE doesn't know what to do with that. So you'll get some numerical junk. It'll go to like 1e12 or 1e minus 12. And of course if you try and plot it all on the same thing, you won't see anything else because 1e12 on a scale with anything else basically makes everything else look impossible. Right? It just looks like 0. Okay? So obviously that's just garbage. Right? That's just SPICE. The real large signal gain would indeed be the small signal gain right at that point. Okay? If you ever see that happen, it's, you know, it's, it's a simulation error, essentially. You just sort of set it up in a way that it's not capable of handling. So again, I mention this only because you, know, you always have to keep your thinking hat on whenever you do a simulation, because sometimes you'll get results that really are just totally bogus and have nothing to do with reality. Okay? Any questions on this, or is this clear? Okay, good. So... We're now basically done with kind of looking at the DC response. So now, obviously, next we want to start looking at the AC response of our amplifier. And so this, again, would be sort of the next simulation we do is a dot AC. OK, now, I don't think there's anything sort of too magic here. You guys should have seen this you know, many, many, many times already. There's just kind of a couple of points I want to mention here. So one is, obviously, hopefully, if you've done a good job, particularly with that really simple amplifier that we built, it should look largely like a single-pole response. And so you might use this to figure out, let's say, what's the gain bandwidth, 
Therefore, what's the unity, you know, unity gain frequency you'd get if you tied into a feedback loop? You'd also, of course, use this to figure out stability, because there may indeed be some, let's say, non-dominant poles over there somewhere. In this particular example, let's say maybe due to the biasing network, but later on, maybe due to because you actually built a multi-stage amplifier. Right? But again, I'm assuming all that stuff you should be fairly familiar with. So we're going to talk some more later about how we really sort of deal with stability and how we can use this to actually translate into some time domain responses. But from that standpoint, you know, we'll, we'll come back to that a little bit later. The only other sort of, or maybe the other couple of things I don't mention here is Remember, when you do an AC simulation, that's at a particular bias point. Right? And that's actually at a particular input. So if you move that bias point, you're actually going to get a different AC behavior. And if you kind of, again, think about that in this context of the amplifier over here, again, let's say we put a pretty large input over there. You want to make sure that it's still actually going to track a small change around that large input fast enough that you don't get any sort of issues, right? So when you do this AC simulation here, you might want to not just simulate it at one bias point, but actually simulate it at multiple bias points. So as an example, let's say that the red curve was for Vn equals, I don't know, 0 volts. You may want to do it again at, let's say, Vn equals 10 millivolts or something like that. Of course, as you shift that input voltage, and by the way, in general, when you increase the input voltage magnitude, generally speaking, the GM goes down. Right? So that means that you're going to get sort of a family of different curves there that depend upon what the exact input bias condition was. So particularly if you have a circuit that you know, you're worried about its stability, or you want to make sure that its performance holds up kind of across a range of inputs, then you should really do this AC simulation across a bunch of those different bias condition, especially if you have something that's really sensitive that may sort of break if you actually moved it slightly from where you expected it to be. OK? OK, so again, I'm assuming most of you guys have seen that kind of stuff before, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it here. The next thing that you would probably do to kind of verify your amplifier, and again, since we've spent a lot of time talking about it here in this class, is do a noise simulation. Now, the thing that's kind of nice about SPICE with noise is it can actually tell you a bunch of different things. It can not only tell you what's the total noise, the output from all possible noise sources, it can actually tell you which different element in your circuit actually caused that noise. This is an example here, and I didn't label it, but that green curve may be the noise from the NMOS device, which let's just call it M1, and so just as a reminder, our amplifier looks something like this. Okay, so let's say that green curve may be the noise from M1. And this blue curve right here may be the noise from M2. Okay? So that's kind of nice that Spice actually does that for you, because in an example, let's say you go and you build your circuit and you decide, okay, I've actually got either too much noise or maybe more noise than I expected, right? Well, what you can do is you can go and you can take spice and then look at, okay, are, are all the different pieces kind of matching up with what I expected? And so particular on this curve here or on this plot, kind of makes sense everything that's happening. It's just the two transistors. And so down at pretty low frequencies, you get the 1 over F noise from the devices. And then up at these higher frequencies, there's just a thermal noise from the two devices. Now, in this particular case, I didn't add any explicit capacitance on the output. And so that's why you can see this is going and remaining very flat out to very, very high frequencies. Of course, if I added some explicit cap right there, then you'd start getting the normal 20 dB per decade roll off at some, let's say, reasonable frequency. OK? So simulation-wise, that's pretty straightforward. The other thing that I think you've now seen before, but I just want to walk through again really quickly, is, OK, so we've now built a real amplifier. I think we know we, we already spent, well, not a lot of time, but a reasonable amount of time sort of analyzing the noise from an amplifier that looked like that with an ideal current source. Now we've got a real current source. OK, and so we can just quickly look at what is that real current source going to do to us from a noise performance standpoint. 
So again, all of you, I think, should have seen this in homework number two. If not, you know, go back and take a look at it again, because you know, it's on the solutions and all that. But essentially, what's going to happen is now that we have that real current source there, it's going to add some noise current into the output. right? Turns out, usually the easiest way to kind of think about this is to figure out, essentially, relative to the noise current I was going to have to get from the input device, how much extra noise current am I adding due to that current source load there? Okay, and by the way, later on, it may not be just due to the current source load. It could be due to a bunch of other devices as well. And we'll see again sort of how that happens. So oftentimes, the easiest way to analyze that is just to input refer everything. Okay, and so just as a reminder, when you do the input referral, really all you're doing is dividing by the GM of the input device. And if you're doing it in noise variance, you just divide by GM squared. Right? So now the reason I've done this is because now you actually get a sort of pretty nice and intuitive result. So once you do that division, you remember that the bias current flowing through these two things has to be the same. The final result you get in terms of the input referred noise is something that looks like this. So it's just 4 kT gamma divided by the GM of the input device. That's kind of the input referred noise you'd get just from M1. Then times this 1 plus V1 star divided by V2 star factor. Okay, kind of makes sense here, right? Because remember, the bias current flowing through these two things is the same. And the noise that comes from here is just set by its GM. Well, the smaller we make the V star of that upper device, the more GM you're going to get relative to the GM of the bottom device. So what this basically tells you is the kind of extra noise, or really the noise factor, which is what I've called this NF down here, that noise factor is just going to be 1 plus V1 star divided by V2 star, which again just comes back and tells us, you know, in that whole long discussion we had about how you size the current sources and things like that, to the extent that you can, you'd like to use a large V star on that current source, because that's going to reduce that noise factor there. So I'm going to use this noise factor sort of, I shouldn't say fairly often, but you'll probably see it fairly often. Because many times people will just say that the noise of the amplifier, and let's just call that, they'll just say it's something like 4 kT gamma over GM1 times NF. And they'll use this for much more complicated amplifiers, and they'll just basically figure out what is that NF as a function of the amplifier's topology and biasing and etc. Okay? So usually when things are specified this way, just keep in mind, they're usually talking about noise densities. Okay. Uh, so sometimes, and I'll even be bad about this as well, sometimes people will use this sort of NF factor, but they'll be referring to integrated noise and not to a noise density. Okay. So just if somebody sort of gives you something and you're not exactly sure, just double check. Okay. But oftentimes, you know, in this formulation, this is really just talking about noise density. And it works reasonably nicely here in this context because, again, since you know that both of the transistors are basically seeing the same load impedance, if you calculate the noise coming from that input device, you basically automatically know what the, noise, the integrated noise from the upper device is going to be as well. Because, again, they both see exactly the same impedance. And so if you know this factor, you can directly just apply it both to the integrated and to the density. But just user beware, if I give you some other more complicated thing, where let's say the noise from M2 was filtered differently than the noise from M1, now you have to be careful about specifying density versus integrated noise. Okay? So I know this will be sort of, you know, you'll see it more later on. It may be a sort of source of confusion. Just keep in mind this NF may be defined either for density or for integrated noise. And just basically based on the context, you can kind of figure out usually what either I'm asking for or what the person who is telling you that number actually means. Okay, any other kind of questions on this? Or? Okay, so that's actually kind of it in terms of our, let's say, characterization procedure, at least so far. So what I want to move on to talk a little bit about is, okay, how are we really going to do this? You know, do we really want to build things with these sort of single-ended OTAs, or are there sort of another way of doing things? 
So here I'm just drawing, let's say, my sort of standard OTA. And in this particular example, I tied it in some feedback configuration. Now, this isn't actually a particularly good OTA design, because as we talked about before, I have resistors here. They're loading the gain, et cetera. Let's not even worry about that for now for a second. Well, so we all kind of know that we, generally speaking, don't usually like to do things like this. Right? Oftentimes, we really prefer to do this so-called differential input OTA, or in this case, it happens to be an op-amp. And when we do that, you know, back actually when you probably learned in E40, the, the first thing you learned was really this differential input thing here. Well, it turns out kind of the only reason you really do that is because it's a pain in the butt to deal with things that aren't referenced to quote unquote zero. Okay? And what I mean by that is the following. Right? So as we said before in this amplifier right here, I always need some nominal VGS on that transistor to get the thing to sort of operate in the right spot. Right? So now if I was to literally put a V in over there, if that V in, for example, was sitting at zero volts, amplifier is not going to work or may not work. Right? Because basically the DC biasing on that point won't really be correct. So to kind of get around that, that's why we usually like to build these differential looking kind of things. Because by doing that, what we've now done is we're always referencing that V in to this other terminal over here. Right? So now we kind of don't have to worry as much about what the nominal point is. You still obviously can't completely ignore it. But now it's sort of clear what the zero point really is. Okay. But actually, if you think about this a little bit more carefully, this should kind of bug you a little bit. Because if you think about it, if I compare what's inside of this box right here to what's right here, I'm actually going to be burning more power. Because I've got extra devices, right? Because this is probably some diff pair with, let's say, a current mirror or something like that. Not only am I actually burning more power, but I probably actually have more noise than I used to. Again, just because I have more devices, right? So this should kind of bother you, because you, you should sort of be like, well, what the heck, you know? Am I really doing this just because I was so annoyed by that nominal bias point that I'm willing to pay extra power, extra noise, essentially just get worse performance just to deal with that? Well, OK, maybe sometimes you are really that lazy, but in fact, there's probably a better reason, right? So what's, what's the reason usually people quote as to why you really want to do a differential amplifier? What's kind of the advantage you get there? Common mode. Advantage. Yeah, I can try and reject some common mode mm -hmm. noise. Right? So to be more specific, let's say I have some situation like the following. Let's say from whatever reason, due to my layout or something like that, there's some capacitive coupling to some other signal in my circuit. This other signal I've just called this V error over here. Well, so in the single-ended thing, you can't tell the difference between what's really your input signal and what's coming from that V error signal, right? Because anything that shows up at that input node, that's all just going to get amplified. Well, at least in principle, if I do a differential circuit, I might indeed still have some V error over there. But again, at least in principle, if I somehow magically get that same V error to show up on the reference node, then at least in principle, as long as my you know, common mode characteristics, and again, we'll talk more about that in one second, but as long as my common mode characteristics from that amplifier are quote unquote good, I should be able to reject that, right? But now actually I'll claim that the way we've sort of drawn this thing here is a little bit problematic. Okay, and and we'll, we'll sort of, maybe we'll dig into exactly you know, how this, this ends up happening in one second. But what I'm going to claim is that if you really want to get this benefit, if you really want to make sure that everything that you can, you're actually going to reject, every sort of other error source that's not a part of your circuit you're going to reject, I'm going to claim that you really have to basically make everything not asymmetric, but perfectly symmetric, okay, or exactly symmetric. So I'm going to claim that anything that's not asymmetric is a good chance for you to pick up basically things that won't exactly behave the way you want them to. In other words, you'll actually pick up things that will cause differential errors. 
Now, somebody other than Will, since I think he was already smirking about what the problem was, in this particular amplifier right here, <coughs> what's the quote-unquote asymmetry that in this particular case would cause a very big problem? The resistor network at the one side, but not at the other side. Okay, yeah, you've got a resistor network at the one side, not the other side. I, I definitely agree with that. There's actually one thing that's even, let's say, sillier than that that would cause a big problem. Any thoughts? No, not Will. We've got to get somebody else uh, thinking here. <clears throat> By the way, you guys recognize this particular symbol here? What does that thing mean? Yeah, it's ground. So if I put a capacitor to ground and I wiggle some voltage over here, you're going to get any voltage change right there? No, right? I have a voltage source that's grounding that thing <coughs> with zero impedance. Over here, this ain't zero impedance, right? It's something else. So I could make this symmetric as much as I wanted and make them exactly the same, but obviously if I've tied this to ground, no dice. Right? Ain't going to work. So in fact, if you really want to make this work, as I said, you really need to make it perfectly symmetric. And what that basically actually means is you have to build fully differential circuits. Because the only way to make it perfectly <coughs> symmetric is to make both sides actually tell you some information about the output. OK? So this is kind of how I would take, and then, you know, now I've changed it from resistive feedback to capacitive, but same idea. Right? So here, what I now have is rather than just having a single output, I'm going to have two differential outputs. The other piece of good news about this, by the way, is that now since both sides of my amplifier are actually being used to give me gain, now from a basically power versus noise standpoint, it's exactly the same. Okay? And by the way, we'll go through this a little bit later if you're curious. It's exactly the same. Okay? Of course, the good news is here that now really I'm totally symmetric. At least structurally, I'm totally symmetric. Okay? So, of course, I can define essentially the differential input voltage, which is just the difference between VI plus and VI minus. The differential output voltage, of course, the difference between VO plus and VO minus. As well as the common mode signals, which is just the average between these two. Okay? Now, even though we've sort of drawn this fully differential circuit and we're going to make all these claims about common mode, now we really don't have to worry about all that much, or that we're going to reject a lot of common mode stuff, turns out you still have to be pretty careful about it. Okay, so just to give you sort of a specific example, let's say that I built this OTA and you know, I did a really good job and all that, and let's say it's running off a 1.2 volt power supply. Okay? And so let's say I give it an input signal that looks something like this. Let's say there's 500 millivolts on VI plus and 501 millivolts on VI minus. Okay? Something like that. And so let's say that this thing closed loop was supposed to give me a gain of, I don't know, let's make it a thousand. Okay? So what should the differential output voltage be? And don't worry about the sign. Yeah, one volt. Okay, we can do math. That's good. Okay, so I got one volt. So now, let's just say that for whatever reason when I built this thing, some cosmic particle decided to lodge itself at the output of this amplifier. Or, I don't know, I built up some charge while I was processing the thing. And so if I looked at basically these two voltages relative to ground, Let's say that actually I got something like 10 volts right there and 9 volts right there. So you think the OTA is going to be particularly happy with this? Again, given that I have a 1.2 volt supply? Not so much, right? Not exactly going to work the way I wanted it to. So the real point here is that even though in principle we should be rejecting common mode, don't ever forget about the common mode in a fully differential circuit. Because just like with you know, many things, as you might expect, it's always the thing that you didn't think about that comes back to bite you. Okay, and in particular, if any of you guys are going out for interview questions or interviews you know, for jobs and things like that, 
very, very classic interview question is to ask about common mode, either feedback or control in a fully differential circuit. Okay, so usually they'll draw something like, you know, some amplifier that looks like this. Let's say that's VI plus, VI minus, of course the output's over there. They'll draw some amplifier that looks like that and ask you, what's wrong with this circuit? Well, so you guys tell me, what's wrong with this circuit? What's the issue you could potentially run into? Common mode is not set. Yeah, the common mode is totally undefined. Right, because this thing here, if those are really ideal current sources, I can put the output voltages kind of anywhere I want. Right, and the current source does nothing to actually fix that. So the problem here is if you really were to build something like this, what you'd actually have to do is find a way to set that common mode. You need something that, you know, intrinsically in the circuit is forcing this common mode to be somewhere where you're actually happy with the operation of the amplifier. Okay? So we'll talk some more later about common mode feedback and control and things like that. But again, keep this in mind because this is really, really classic interview question. You know, it's almost like one of the first things they ask you, you go into some analog design place and they say, okay, you know, here's this simple amplifier, tell me what's wrong with it. Okay? And by the way, I know lots of people that just didn't quite get this right. So don't forget about common mode. By the way, anybody ever interviewed and gotten this question before? Or, or maybe I should ask, how many of you guys have interviewed analog design jobs? Ah, okay. <laughs> One or two. Okay. So maybe just, you know, to have it a little bit more fun, just to see if you guys get it. Let's say I actually built an amplifier that looked like this. Do I have a quote-unquote common mode problem? with this, or is the common mode actually pretty well defined? It's well defined, right? What's actually defining it? Yeah, so basically I know that that point right there is just going to be VDD minus I times R, right? So it's well defined. Now, whether or not that's good for the next stage, different problem. But at least I know what it is, right? Over here, no idea. Now. Actually, it's kind of interesting in a lot of the modern technologies that you might be working with, when you really build that current source, you know, obviously you're going to do it with some transistor. And unfortunately, the RO of that transistor often is not as high as you'd like it to be. And so you actually end up with something that's kind of well-defined. But trust me, if you move it across process corners and things like that, not going to work so well. So even if you don't have a very high gain amplifier or anything like that, you're still probably going to want to use some sort of circuit to define that common mode. And again, we'll talk a whole lot more about that later on, I think maybe in a couple weeks or so, when we have a lecture on common mode feedback. OK. So now that we sort of know why we want to do fully differential circuits, and sort of at least just that we have to keep in mind the common mode, now we should actually take a look at just what are some of the characteristics that are important from this standpoint. And in particular, because we now have this fully differential circuit, that really has two inputs and two outputs. Now, actually, when we sort of define the gain of this circuit, it's not actually just one number. It's actually, in this case, four different numbers. So really what's happening here is that the amplifier, you know, the way we try and use it usually is that we take some differential input, and we want to measure what's the differential output. Okay, so that's what we'll call, let's say, this ADM. That's the differential mode gain. Okay? <clears throat> that's usually what we think about. But there's actually also this other output. That other output is like the common mode output. Okay? And in fact, not only that, we also have another input, which is the common mode input. Okay, so not only do we have some differential mode gain, we actually also have some common mode gain. Which, by the way, just in case you haven't figured it out already, if I say ACM, you know, CM is like common mode, DM is differential mode. And then, in fact, not only do we get those, but we also have these so-called mode conversion gains. In other words, let's say over here, if you move the common mode input, you might actually create some differential output. And if you move the differential input, you might actually create some common mode output. Okay, so... The, again, the convention here is whatever the first letter is, that's the input. Second letter, that's the output. Okay? 
Uh, they don't have to be nonlinear, actually. In fact, these could be perfectly linear effects. And oftentimes, the way we'll characterize them is to linearize around a bias point and measure these things. Okay, and we'll, we'll talk in one second sort of where they might come from. They could obviously also have some nonlinearities involved in them. But here I'm talking even just a, from a purely linear standpoint. Okay, and by the way, if you're sort of a math guy, if I have two inputs and two outputs, I can represent the gain for that structure to be a matrix with four quantities. That's this matrix right here. Okay? So let's just kind of walk through and see what we actually want all these things to be. So first, let's start with a simple one. What do I want the differential mode gain to be? If I could just choose it to be anything I want, obviously. Yeah, I want infinity, right? OK, that's the standard one. All right. What do I want the common mode gain to be? Yeah, I want that to be 0. Why do I want that to be 0? OK, it's a differential amplifier. So why is it kind of either important or useful that I make the column mode gain 0? If you're, the higher your column mode gain <coughs> is, the less use you're going to get out of the amplifier. OK, that's kind of right. Let's maybe follow up on that. Uh, that, that's, that you're going in the right direction. So what would be the issue with an amplifier that has large common mode gain? Or really, I should be more careful. What would be the issue if you had a bunch of amplifiers with large common mode gain? Rail. Say that again? Rail. Yeah, you sure. might rail out, right? So let's say I have a bunch of these OTAs driving each other. If they all have some large common mode gain, then let's say I put some, I don't know, one millivolt column mode error at the input. If each one of them has a gain of 100, <coughs> after about two stages, you're done, right? Because you've just railed out, you've hit the supply, and the whole thing doesn't work anymore, right? So that's why, in general, with the differential amplifier, you really want column mode gain to essentially be 0. OK? Now let's look at some of the next terms. So now, in particular, let's look at this. ACDM, in other words, the common mode to differential mode conversion gain. What do we want that to be? Zero. Yeah, OK, so let me even be more strong. So you definitely want it to be 0, but you know, if you had to pick between, let's say, this one and this one, which one would you definitely choose to be 0? Yeah, I'd definitely choose this one to be 0, right? Because that one, that's the only thing that basically saves my butt from all the junk that's on the common mode. And by the way, when you build fully differential amplifiers, pretty much literally, if there's any junk anywhere in your circuit, or any noise, that's obviously what I mean by junk, and well, I shall be more careful. Noise meaning things that like other, other circuits around there that are moving around and causing coupling into your circuit, <coughs> you're going to try and make all of that junk show up as common mode. And by the way, sometimes that junk is really big in comparison to what you care about. So that junk could easily be 100, 200 millivolts, while you're trying to measure, let's say, a microvolt or 10 microvolts or even a millivolt. Okay? So you really, really want this to be 0, or really as small as you can possibly make it. Because the smaller you can make it, the more junk you can tolerate on the common mode without worrying about screwing up your differential signal. Right? Now, by the way, there's lots of different ways that that can happen. And we'll see sort of an example of that in a second. But almost all of them are related to asymmetry. Okay, there's something that is not exactly the same on both sides of the amplifier that causes you to convert common mode into differential. <coughs> OK, well, so just one last sort of gain thing over here. We said we can convert common mode into differential. Of course, anytime you have asymmetry, you're also going to convert differential into common mode. OK? So what do we want that to be? Nothing too hard here. Zero. Yeah, you also want that to be 0. Now, why is it that I still care about this being 0? Like, why, why is that kind of important? <clears throat> what happens if it's not exactly 0? And again, at the end of the day, I probably mostly care about only my differential output. So why do I still want this to probably be close to 0? Same thing. 
Okay, you're right. If it's too big, the output DC voltage bias might move around. I agree with that. Let's, let's even assume that that's not too big of an issue. Because usually this conversion is not too big. Well, what could actually happen? And again, keep in mind, you might have actually a cascade of these things. So what could actually happen? Think about two of these, you know, just take this drawing and put another one next to it. What might happen that's bad? There we go. Exactly. Right? So what might happen is, let's say in stage one, you have some differential input that gets converted into a common mode output. And then I'll do it in a different color. Well, if that happens, then in stage two, that change in common mode might convert back into a differential output, right? So now, obviously, the quote unquote good news is here is this thing has been attenuated by two things that are supposed to be small. But, but still, you'd like this to be you know, not too big. Because if it's too big, then you're really just relying on this again, right? And remember, there's oftentimes lots of junk that will show up in places. Right, so you want to minimize the amount of errors you're going to make. Now, by the way, in terms of priority, it really is you know, ACDM that you want to make sure is really, really zero. Because if you do a good job of that, that helps with everything else. But don't forget about the other two. Okay? This one mostly because of biasing. And this one mostly because it's just another way for you to pick up errors. Okay? Make sense to everybody here? OK, so if you start thinking about things this way, then actually a lot of times the way people sort of like to characterize these basically behaviors is in terms of these so-called rejection ratios. So what a rejection ratio really is is just essentially what's the ratio between basically the gain you actually wanted, which in this case may be the differential mode gain, versus the gains that you don't want. Okay. So in particular, the one you've probably heard the most about is the so-called common mode rejection ratio. So here I'm going to define that common mode rejection ratio as just being the differential mode gain divided by the common mode to differential mode conversion gain. Okay, sometimes when people quote common mode, like common mode rejection ratio, which usually people say CMRR for short, sometimes they'll actually quote that as the ratio between this and this meaning the differential mode divided by just the common mode. Here, I'm actually going to define it as being the differential mode divided by the conversion gain, OK? Because that's oftentimes what you care a little bit more about, OK? Well, so again, CMRR, probably something you've heard about many times before. In fact, oftentimes people will define also the so-called power supply rejection ratio. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in one second. But Really, the important thing to keep in mind is that all quote unquote terminals in your amplifier, they're all inputs. Okay? In fact, even things that you don't normally think of as being a quote unquote terminal is also an input into your amplifier. So, as an example, you might like change temperature, and that might change something about the output of your amplifier. And so, you might be interested in what's the rejection ratio to that thing, let's say to temperature. Right, so maybe it's temperature, maybe it's process, whatever it is. You can kind of define a rejection ratio to all those things. Again, the reason I mention that is just remember that your amplifier can actually be affected by just about anything you can think of. Okay, and so oftentimes you should check how much are you going to be affected by all those other things. Okay? Now, specifically, you know, fine, you have to do this. That's usually not too bad, or at least if you sort of think about it, you can figure out why things should be happening there. These CMRR and PSRR, these are kind of the most common metrics people talk about, just because they're the ones that sort of, you know, at least in voltages, they're the most direct or most obvious to think about. Yeah? Aren't like the inputs usually defined as ADM over ACM? Yeah, so different people define it different ways. Just, you know, take a look at what they actually meant. I usually do it this way just because, again, that's oftentimes what you care a little bit more about. 
but yes, yeah, so, you know, the more standard one is ADM over ACM. So you know, if you see something, just you know, make sure it's clear. Now, unfortunately, life actually gets even more interesting than this because people will often define these two things as well. But as we'll see in one second, I'm actually going to claim that if you define all three of these, they're not mutually independent. Okay, and so in order to see that, let's actually go through the following sort of just conceptual thought experiment. So let's say I have an amplifier, okay? So I'm going to draw it as being a single-ended output. Well, actually, no, I don't have to. So I'll draw it like this. So I have some output like this, okay? And so now remember, if I wanted to characterize these things, the way you would do that is you'd put in some common mode input, or you'd put in some power supply input, and measure what's the differential voltage at the output of the amplifier, right? And you'd compare that to this differential voltage here, or this differential gain, I should say. So let's just sort of draw how we might do that. So let's say in particular that I'm interested in characterizing the common mode rejection. Well, so the way I might do that is add that voltage source that I just drew there. I'd tie it to both inputs. That's how I do a common mode input, right? And then I'd measure the differential output. Similarly, let's say that I wanted to measure the so-called power supply rejection, where in particular the way I'm going to do that is I've added that extra voltage source there. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is just so that it's really clear, I'm going to define what are the positive and negative references for each one of these voltages. Okay. Because remember, all voltages are relative. There's no such thing as an absolute voltage. So I'm going to call this here voltage number one. That might be what I think of as my common mode voltage. Okay, I'm going to call that right there, which is the difference between VDD and VSS. I'm going to call that voltage number two. Okay. So now, let's say that I called this, you know, whatever quantity I measured by moving this around and then measuring the differential output. And then dividing that by just putting a differential input over here, what that gain was. Let's say I called that my power supply rejection ratio relative to VDD. Okay? Well, notice if I then wanted to go and measure this so called power supply rejection ratio for VSS, what does that actually mean? Or in other words, can I really do this independently of what I just did here? What do you guys think? No, right? Because notice, once I've defined the, the potential 1 and 2 there, this third thing that's right there is totally defined, right? Just by KVL. So oftentimes, even though people talk about you know, VDD rejection versus VSS rejection, you have to be really careful with what they actually mean. Okay? Because as an example, if you were to put another voltage source right there to try and measure the so-called VSS rejection, what you're really equivalently doing is putting in both something on that you know, potential number two over there and something on that potential number one right there. Okay? So in other words, if you've measured this and this, you should automatically know what that is. Okay? Again, simply because since all voltages are relative and I've only got basically three terminals here, I can only unique actually it's really only two. I can only uniquely define two voltages. Okay? So it doesn't matter which two voltages you pick. In other words, you can uniquely define two and one, or two and three, or one and three doesn't matter which two you pick, but you only get to pick two. The other one is always just going to pop out. Okay. So again, just be really careful when people sort of define these things, or even when you yourself are measuring it. Be very careful as to what voltage you are actually exciting. Okay? And when I say what voltage, I really mean you know, draw the thing out this way and keep, keep track of what's your positive reference and what's your negative reference. Okay. Does this kind of make sense to people? or Again, anybody seen this before, or is this news to people? 
How many of you guys have measured the VSF rejection of an amplifier before? Measured the VDD rejection? Measured any kind of rejection? I didn't do that in 140? 142, maybe, something? No? OK, well, you know, don't worry or don't fear. You're going to get plenty of opportunity to do that here, because you're going to be building stuff that's going to have noise on the supply and noise in the common mode, and you're going to get to figure out what the real issue is. So you know, if you haven't done it before, you'll get the chance. But again, just keep in mind, voltages are always relative. If they're always relative, you've got to know what's actually defined relative to what. OK? OK, so what I'll sort of finish up on is maybe just a couple of examples of sort of how this is useful and where sort of some of these errors might pop up from. OK? So again, let's sort of start out with maybe our single-ended or single-ended output OTA. Which again, we're just going to place in capacitive feedback. So let's say something like this. OK, so let's say that's my OTA there. And again, let's say that there's some error signal, or really just some other signal in our circuit, that for whatever reason, we have some coupling capacitance onto that error signal. Okay, that's showing up on our input right there. So first, just as maybe sort of a quick exercise or review, if this was my circuit right here, what would be my output as a function of both VI, the input, and V error? What would that be set by? <coughs> Maybe start with the easy thing first. What if I didn't have that error signal there? What would be the gain of this amplifier? CS over CF. Yeah, it would just be minus CS over CF times VI, right? OK, now that I've got that error signal there, again, you can't really tell the difference between that error signal and the input. So what else is going to show up at the output? What's the gain from that going to be? Plus C by CF into E. Yeah, it's, well, it's actually minus, but you got it right. So it's going to be minus CE over CF times V error, right? OK, so now we'll come back to making this you know, fully differential in one second. But other than that, what, what could you try and do to sort of <coughs> fix this problem? Is there anything you can do? Use large feedback capacitors. Yeah. Um, OK, you could try and make the feedback capacitor big, which would then mean that your CS would be big. <coughs> What's the penalty for doing that? There's lots of area. Lots of area. What else? I heard somebody say it. Yeah, power, right? Because now for the same speed, I need more GM. Okay, so you're right. I could try and do that, but that kind of sucks because I'm spending more power, right? And I don't want to spend any more power. So anything else I can do, or try and do? I should, I suppose. Differential. OK, again, you know, we'll go back to that in one second. Yes, you could make a differential, and we'll see sort of what, the, what comes up there. But you know, anything else really simple that you could try and do, or that you would want to do, I guess, from the get-go? When you built this circuit, when you, let's say, for example, when you laid it out, how would you, you, know, how would you try and go about laying it out? in particular from the standpoint of trying to reduce the impact of this error stuff. What would be important? By the way, this isn't rocket science. Yeah? Try to make the interconnect to the virtual ground small. Yeah, OK. <laughs> Basically, try and make that CE right there small, right? <coughs> in other words, try and keep that virtual ground as far away or as isolated from all the other junk that could be coupling onto it. Right? Yeah, we'll definitely want to do that. Now, unfortunately, obviously, sometimes there's only so much you can do. Right? So there's still going to be some CE there. The other thing that sometimes that you know people who are really clever say is, okay, well, why don't you just make V error small? Yeah, you know, that'd be nice. Sometimes we can actually do that. Most of the time, unfortunately, that's just some other stupid circuit that I don't know is a digital gate that's toggling or whatever, and there's not too much you can do to actually change that other than just you know, maybe if you change the swings or something, but you know, oftentimes there's not a whole lot you can do there. So yeah, generally what you want to do is try and make that CE small. Okay, and so 
you should indeed do as good of a job of that as you possibly can, but eventually you're going to run into a limit. Okay, so again, of course, if you do that, then now really that's when you say, okay, fine, let's go fully differential. Okay? So now let's just draw that. And in practice, that CE is mostly from the capacitor plates or from? Could be from all over the place, right? So, and I'll actually draw, I'll draw an example of that in one second. But, you know, it can come from very innocuous places. And we'll see that. So now let's say I go fully differential. Okay, so I'm still going to have my CS, oops, my CF. Of course, I'm as I'm fully differential, I'm going to make all of these values as exactly the same as I possibly can, right? And so now what I'm really going to rely on is that, okay, fine, if I have some coupling, let me just try and make sure that that coupling is exactly the same to both inputs of the amplifier, right? And again, by exactly the same, I really mean exactly the same. So actually, just as an example here, what would be one way that you might actually get let's say, common mode to differential conversion. What mistake or what sort of slight error could have happened that would cause common mode to differential conversion in this particular circuit here? Any thoughts? Yeah? But the, uh, the CRS may not be the same or the CS may not be the same. Yeah, okay, right. So let's say that actually this CS over here was actually CS plus delta CS. Well, because it's ever so slightly different, then now, basically, even though, let's say, these CEs are both the same, the gain from the positive side is not the same as the gain from the negative side. That's going to cause common mode to differential conversion. In fact, also the other one, which again is you know, fairly innocuous, is maybe there's some slight difference between the capacitors at the input there. Well, again, even though you tried to make it common mode, now you're actually going to get some small common mode to differential conversion. So the name of the game with all these is really make it as symmetric as you possibly can. And so maybe just to see sort of a quick example of that, let's just draw a picture of like, you know, if you were to do this thing in layout, what might be a trick you might want to play to sort of fix some of these issues? So in particular, let's say that these are my two input lines. So let's say it's VI plus and VI minus. Okay? <coughs> so the world would be great and beautiful if you just had that on your entire chip, but you know, unfortunately that's usually not what happens. And if nothing else, usually you need like a power supply or a bias line or something like that. And let's say you just, you know, you happen to have one of those things running over here. Okay, so now if you really want things to be very, very symmetric. Anything you can do to try and fix this? And let me just call this, you know, V error over here, just to be clear. Any tricks you could play in the layout to try and fix the problem? Or, okay, maybe I should do this first. What is the problem here, by the way? What's the asymmetry? What's different about VI plus versus VI minus? VI plus is closer to V error than VI minus. Yeah, exactly, right? So the cap I'm going to get from there to there is going to be larger than the cap I get from there to there, right? Okay, so that's bad news. All right, any simple trick you can play to fix this? Rotate it by 90 degrees. Um, okay, that's actually, that's a good one. So if I could actually make it so that now VI plus and VI minus are running like this, you're right, that would actually now become symmetric. The bad news is that unfortunately, you know, given the way I drew it, I needed to go from this point to that point. So I'm not exactly sure how I fixed that, but you're right, in principle, if I could do that, that would be a great thing to do. Anything else? Could you just stick the air between them? Say yeah, that again? Could you just stick the, the air between them? Okay, you could do that. You could try and stick the air in between them. Um, that may not, uh, that's actually not a bad idea. The only minor problem with that is that I've now made both of these capacitors larger. So you're right, they may actually be the same, but I've made both of them bigger. So if there's any other asymmetry in the circuit, I'm kind of going to be amplifying the, the issue I get with this VR. But actually, that's, that's another good one. Anything else you might be able to do? Put one more VR on the other side. Ah, OK. That's, that's another one. Good. So you could put another VR on the other side over here. 
that's also not a bad idea. The only, again, minor issue with this is you're actually increasing the amount of coupling capacitance you get from the error onto the signal. So anything else you can do that does not increase the capacitance? Draw a, a mirror of VI plus and VI minus on the other side of the error. Ah, OK. Um, yes, although again, I think that actually sort of increases the capacitance. But you're going really, you've almost got it. There we go. Twist, ever, anybody ever heard of twisted pair? Right? Twisted pairs, you do that for exactly this reason, right? And so let me maybe draw that in yet a different color just so it's clear. So if you really want to, you know, it's not necessarily the best. There's some other issues with that. But if you really wanted to do it, what you'd basically do is something like that. And let me maybe I just redraw it on the side just so it's really clear. So what you might do is something like, let's say that's your VR. You'd have VI plus, VI minus, and then swizzle the lines. Right? So now if you swizzle the lines, the total cap hasn't changed, but you're just making it symmetric on the two sides. Okay, now obviously when you do this, this crossing point has to be in two different metal layers, because if it's not, you've just shorted things together. That's generally not what you want. Okay, so be careful if you do this, by the way, because oftentimes this means you have to put vias in somewhere to get those swizzles to happen. Those vias often have a lot of resistance associated with them. But again, if you're actually sort of paranoid, this is a fairly common technique. Okay, actually, by the way, a lot of the stuff you guys mentioned was also a pretty good idea. So making it orthogonal, that's a pretty good idea. You know, if you can make it sort of in the center, uh, unfortunately, that has larger cap, but that also works from a symmetry standpoint. So all those actually work pretty well. And by the way, those are all also ways in which, if you don't exactly follow these rules, how you can pick up these basically conversion gain type of, types of errors. Okay. So, OK. So now just one sort of last quick thing before we wrap up for today. Given sort of all these issues we talked about you know, with conversion gain and what we'd really like from our ideal differential amplifier, let's take a look at these sort of three different options for an input stage and see if we can figure out pretty quickly what do we think is actually the best option for us to go for. OK? So what I've drawn here is kind of three versions, right? So one is here, let's say I had a differential input stage that just was two common source transistors with both the things tied to ground, OK? I've got another one here, which is a differential input pair, but where I've explicitly tied the body to this tail node, OK? So the diff pair has an actual current source, and I've tied the bodies to the tail node, whereas over here, I've just tied the bodies to ground, OK? So first, let's start out with this you know, version A right here. So actually, in comparison to the other two, what's good about version A? Source is always grounded. OK, why is that good? It's not volume. Really volume. OK, source is grounded. The body's grounded. I guess you know, all that's but, you know, from a circuit standpoint, why is that good news for me? Like, why, why does that help me? Swing. Yeah, the swing's larger, right? So I can tolerate, actually, a sort of wider range of swing at the output, right? Because I don't have this current source at the bottom just eating up my headroom. Yeah, that's, that's good. What's bad? Why do I not generally want to use this, particularly if I care about all these mode conversions that I talked about before? CMRR. OK, in particular, what, what is the CMRR? And I'll be more specific. If we define, if, we def if we're just interested in ADM divided by ACM, what is that for this amplifier? Say that again? It's one. It's one. Right? Because you can't tell the difference. Right? Because the, the source is ground. So you move plus one millivolt on one side over here, and you know, let's say one, minus one millivolt <coughs> over there. The gain is just going to be GMRO, right? For both of them. Well, guess what? If you move them both by plus one millivolt, gain is still just GMRO for both of them. Right? So the bad news about that amplifier, which oftentimes people will call it a pseudo-differential amplifier, is that your column mode rejection, at least your ADM divided by your ACM, is basically crap. It's just one. And again, that's bad news because, as an example, if you have any small common mode error, that column mode error is going to get amplified up as you go down a chain of these amplifiers. OK? All right, so now, obviously, if I have these two, <coughs> 
So the good news about these is that now since I have a current source there, <laughs> at least if I have an ideal current source, <clears throat> then if I move stuff around, and this is going to be my column mode input now, if I move that column mode input around, then at least ideally speaking in at DC, my column mode gain should be zero, right? Because whatever column mode voltage shows up over here, that voltage down there should basically just be VTH plus an overdrive below it. And that should have no impact on the circuit on this current source in terms of how much current it gives you, right? So it's kind of like saying that you've degenerated the input pair by like zero conductance, meaning that the effective GM from a column mode standpoint would basically be zero, right? So obviously those are better from a column mode standpoint. Now the only sort of last interesting question, which we'll just quickly ask you guys and then we'll get out of here. Between B and C, which one do you think actually has better column mode rejection in a real circuit? Maybe in the back. B? B, okay, why? Body effect. Okay, what about body effect? Okay, well, <laughs> well, why is you know you're absolutely right, but so why is it that that's a good thing? What's the problem with the body effect over here? Uh, changes the VTH, right? Okay, changes the VTH. How do we usually model that from a small signal standpoint? Is that other generator that we you know usually neglect but would have to sit there? <coughs> Anybody remember that GMB thing? Right, the body GM. Well, the bad news is on that other circuit on the right over there, because the body is tied to ground, if you move the common mode voltage around, even though the VGS doesn't change, the VBS would change. Yeah. Ah, okay. So if you have an NMOS you know, device and you don't have a triple wall process, oftentimes you have to do C. Although, if I really, really care about it, for exactly this reason, I might actually use a PMOS input stage, right? Because if I have the PMOS, then I have the ability to actually tie that body to the right spot, okay? So I think we'll pick back up with this uh, on Thursday, so I'll see you guys then.